The first lesson for this 12th Sunday after Pentecost is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And, Ab and Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is the word of our Lord. The second lesson is taken from the book of Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, beginning at verse 32. Jesus says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your hearts will be also. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And grace and mercy and peace belong to you through the merits of God, our he Heavenly Father, and through his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning <clears throat> that we'll focus a few minutes on is that Gospel lesson, Luke chapter 12, verses 32 through 40, where Jesus encourages us the same as he's been encouraging us throughout this whole chapter of Luke to set your minds not so much on things on this earth, because they'll last for a while, but not forever. So he says, therefore, if you're a wise investor, set your things on things that are above. He's talking about spiritual things and the heavenly things that God gives us through his word and sacraments. Your brothers and your sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. It was probably about 15 or 16, 17 years ago when my wife and I finally decided we had been married a couple years at that time. <clears throat> we should probably sit down with somebody who knows what he's doing and, and 
invise us or advise us on some investments. She had done it for all the time that she has been working at the bank. I had been doing it since 1993, taking a little bit out of every paycheck and, and putting it in some kind of a investment vehicle. But now we were married and we thought, you know, is this good to have these things over here and these things over here? Maybe we should find somebody that would help us. So somebody directed us to a friend who was actually one of Chris's people at the bank and they said let's just sit down and we'll take a look at it so we sat across the table from him and he says well <clears throat> this is what you got right now and this is what you might conservatively expect over the course of this many years that you have working now all of this of course is is if you work for this many years and if the rate is this and if this is is just right but he kept on using this this term that I had never heard of in my life. He kept on saying the ROI. The ROI is going to be this much if this happens. But if you go a little bit more aggressively, then your ROI is going to be a little bit better than that. If you do this, maybe after you get to be 50 or 55, you might scale back on your aggressiveness, be a little bit more, more, more humble in your investments, and the ROI might drop down a little bit. And he must have seen the look on my face eventually because he said, now, do I have any questions? And I said, what in the world is an ROI? And you might laugh at that, but at the time, I had no idea what an ROI was. And, and they finally said, you know, ROI is just an acronym for, everybody know it? Yeah. Why didn't I know that at 35 years old? Return on investment. It's usually a money term. It's usually an investment term. And so if you invest this many dollars at this particular rate, over the long term, you can expect a return on your investment of. And then they run down all of these scenarios and use all these charts and, and say, well, if this happens, then this might happen. Now, ROI, that return on investment, <clears throat> is typically a money term. But it's not always a money term. Because I've also heard that same phrase being used for other things in life. For example, in sports, what might your ROI be if you work tremendously hard? You give 110% in practice, in the games. What might your ROI be? A better batting average. A better fielding percentage. If you're talking music, what might your ROI be if you sit at the piano bench for a half an hour every single day and you do the scales that you hate and you do the chords that you hate, but you just keep on doing it? Your ROI might be you can play stuff that you never, ever thought that you would be able to play. Your return on investment in exercise, if you watch what you put in your body, if you make sure that you're doing some exercise, what might your ROI be, your return on investment? A healthier body, maybe losing a few pounds. I've also heard the term applied to our spiritual lives. And, and you got to be careful when, when you're talking about your spiritual lives and an ROI because that could very easily lead us to believe that, well, if you work hard enough at your spiritual life, if you do the right things, if you don't say the wrong things, if you work hard at the Ten Commandments, then your return on your investment might be heaven. Now, you and, I, you and I know that that's not the way that heaven works. Heaven is a gift. Heaven is not something that we work for, but heaven is a 100% grace gift from God. It's an undeserved gift. But it can be applied in, in, a, in a way that is in accordance with our theology. Your ROI, if you watch your lives, meaning you keep the Ten Commandments, so you strive to keep those Ten Commandments. You, you never give the devil a foothold in your life. You watch what comes out of your mouth. You watch what your eyes see. Your ROI might be a life that is a whole lot more peaceful, less stressful, less consequences of sin. And ROI might be <clears throat> just an easier life as a Christian. 
for the most part. Now that said, that's kind of what Jesus is getting at in this verse, in these verses in chapter 12 of Luke. He has something to say about our priorities. He has something to say about our possessions. He has something to say about our, our greed. He has something to say about our eternal inheritance in heaven. Last week, we were reminded, if you recall, that there is nothing in this world that is more important than our relationship with our Savior. Everything is meaningless if you don't have your Savior at the beginning and the head of your life. Number one priority, meaningless, worthless, means nothing to you. This week, Jesus builds on that. And he says, make my relationship with you your greatest treasure. And he says, when you invest that way, your return on your investment is going to be much better than you ever could imagine on this earth. Much better than you could ever imagine. 12%, that's not going to be even comparable to what Jesus promises us as an ROI when we make faith our priority and we make our relationship with him a priority in our lives. And, and so Jesus starts out in verse 33 by saying, Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. What is he describing? Nothing on this earth. There is nothing on this earth that is immune to these kinds of things. It could be exhausted. Moth could destroy. Rough, rust could corrode. There is nothing on this earth that Jesus describes in those verses. So in other words, what is he talking about? He's talking about heaven. He's talking about the spiritual treasures that lead us all the way to heaven. Jesus is telling you to invest your lives, your time, your priorities in heaven. Because it's a sure thing. It's not like your investments that the investment advisor says, well, if things go as planned, if nothing changes, then you might expect this over the long haul. So if Jesus tells us that we ought to be spending our biggest focus on investing on what is eternal in what is in heaven, we, we ought to listen to him. Based on who he is, he doesn't give us bad advice, investment advice especially, and he also talks about this wonderful gift called heaven. What is heaven? It's an investment that is beyond the reach of anything bad in this world. Which means what? No bear or bull market is going to affect your investment in heaven. No boom or bubble or bust is going to invest your investment in heaven. No dishonest investment advisor, and there have been plenty of them over the course of history, is going to determine the outcome of your heavenly investment. Heaven is a sure thing. Jesus says, your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Period. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. There is no depending on market conditions. There is no after the taxes and the fees are added in, then you might have this. There is no fast talker who is giving you all the legalese. Well, these are subject to this and this and this, and they talk so fast that you can't even understand them at the end of an investment commercial. There is none of that. Jesus says your father has been pleased to give you the treasure of heaven. Again, period after that. Why? And, and, and how can we be so sure? How can Jesus be so sure? Because our Father was pleased with the sacrifice that Jesus made on Good Friday 2,000 years ago. He's pleased to give us this investment, return, heaven, because Jesus was pleased to give us his life with the horrific death on the cross on Good Friday. Jesus was pleased to live his whole life perfectly. No hiccups, no problems, no, you know something, I, I let that slip or I did this a little bit bad. No, Jesus fulfilled God's perfect law perfectly. And because of all of that, because of Jesus' love for us, God the Father is pleased to give us the kingdom of heaven. Pleased to give us the kingdom of heaven. That's like getting <clears throat> the deed to that lake house that you drive past and say, oh, I wish I could live there. And then sometime during your lifetime, 
you come to your house and you open up the mail and you hear you have a deed to that lake house. And that lake house is multi-million dollar worth everything. It's got a beautiful view. It's got a beautiful everything. And then inside that letter is also a passbook for your savings account that has more money than you could ever spend in a billion lifetimes. That's what heaven is. Close to getting heaven what it is. Much better than that. Your father was pleased with Jesus' complete and perfect sacrifice that he says, now I am pleased to give you my kingdom. Now, however, in the meantime, that being said, your future is secure in heaven. How do we react and how do we live a life that responds in a way that might say thank you for what Jesus has done for us? Well, that's where Jesus' investment advice comes in. He says, I just want you to live in a way that reflects your attitude at what I have given for you. Specifically, three things in, in these verses from Luke chapter 12. First of all, he says, don't be afraid. As in the first verse, don't be afraid, little flock, because the Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid of what can happen in this life. How good are you at that? Kids, they're afraid of the things that go bump in the night. They're afraid of the things that are under the bed. They're afraid of the, the darkness. They're afraid of the things that are in the closet. But then as you get older, your fears automatically kind of disappear, don't they? Adults, no, your fears don't disappear as you get older in your life. Your fears mature, if you want to call it that. Your fears say, you know something, in afraid of, instead of being afraid of what is underneath my bed... Dad, check it, please, or the spider on the wall. Your fears become, how am I in the world am I going to pay for this? Kids' education. I've got a mortgage that there's no way that I can keep up with. I've got cars to pay for. I've got business expenses. How in the world are we going to swing this? That's the kind of fears that we grow up into in our lives. Or what about my kids? Parents are concerned about their children. I wonder what's going to happen to them. I wonder who they're going to be hanging out with. I wonder who they're going to marry. I wonder what's going to happen to them. That's the kind of fears that we graduate into as you grow up in your lives. But what does Jesus say to that? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And we say, but what about my job? And what about the economy? Because they're talking about another recession, you know, uh, maybe a great recession, worse than the one in 2008 and following. What about China? What about tariffs? What about, what about my health? What about if I die? Nothing in this world. No fears can take away the heaven that your heavenly Father has given to you already. Your future is set. It's in his hands. Not based on what we have done. Our future is based on what Christ has done for us on the cross. That's the first thing that Jesus says. If you want to be a good investor in this life and wait for heaven, don't be afraid. The second thing he says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Now, we might take a look at that and we say, well, Jesus sometimes exaggerated, right? Jesus couldn't mean that we should sell our possessions and give to the poor. Does Jesus really mean that? He said it. It's not socialism. It's being a Christian. What does Jesus say? He doesn't say sell all of your possessions and give all of your possessions to the poor. That would be not using the common sense that God gave you. But sell your possessions and give to the poor simply means being a Christian and loving your neighbor as you would have your neighbor love you. As God has blessed you, and don't tell me that God has not blessed you, as God has blessed you, give to those people who have not been as blessed. That's investing in heaven. And then the last thing <clears throat> that Jesus says his followers should do if they're really concerned about that eternal investment that is theirs in heaven someday is what he talks about for about half of our text, starting in verse 35. He says, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. In other words, be ready for when Jesus comes. 
And we'll talk about this more at the end times of the year, the, the last four Sundays of the church year. We really focus on that, but, but here it's a good reminder for us. Be ready. Keep your lamps burning because you don't know when Jesus is going to come back to take you home to the promised heaven that he has promised you. In other words, don't be lazy in, in your life. There are plenty of things to be doing while we are still waiting for him to take us home. There are plenty of things to be shared with your neighbors. There is plenty of gospel teaching advice that you can share with those who need it. There is plenty of things that you can be doing to make sure that what Jesus says is what we are doing. The, the other extreme, he says, don't do this or don't do that. He says, don't be lazy in your Christian life, but don't also be the, on the other side. Don't pretend that this life is something that you can be doing without being a Christian. In, in other words, you know, there are sometimes people that they could never ever guess that you were a Christian by the way that you lived your life by the words that came out of your mouth, by the way that you treated your husband or your wife or your children. If somebody came up to you and, and, and all of a sudden started the relationship with you and all of a sudden they were able to look at you, would they be able to tell that you are a Christian? Don't live in such a way that says, I have no relationship with my Savior whatsoever. And, and, and that's all wrapped up in the last thing that Jesus says in verse 34. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your treasure is your investment portfolio, or your home, or your family, or your business, or your status, or your position, or your children, it doesn't matter what on the earth that is. If your treasure is those kinds of things, then you know what? Those can be taken away. And they can be taken away in, in an instant. All it would take would be a stock market collapse or a loss of job or a death. All of that is going to be gone. But if your heart's most precious treasure is heaven, and if you make your treasure that heavenly home that God has promised us, then your wallet might be a little bit lighter and you might not have the same kind of paying job that your life might expect. Your experiences might be different, no matter, because when you step the last step on this earth and when you take your last breath on this earth, your heaven is secure. Your return on investment is not something that can be iffy based on this or that or the other thing. It's what Jesus has promised us. <clears throat> Invest in heaven, Jesus says, especially now while you are living on this earth. It's always been the best way to live, whether it's good times or bad times, financially or otherwise, and it will always pay off in the long run. Jesus guarantees that investment. Amen. Amen. The peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.